Oh, hello. We are back. Uh, episode 45 of the Junk Drawer Show was finally recorded. Uh, and it was on video, which we haven't done, or I haven't done in a while. So I decided to do this introduction um, with video as well. And I hope you appreciate it because holding my phone, eh, like MySpace angles, is real uncomfortable. Uh, but I do it for you. I do it for the fans. Um, and uh, I won't ever forget where I came from. So there's that. Uh, so quick life updates. We got a shitload of snow, about two feet, as you can kind of see here. And this is, you know, we've had a full day of sun now, so things are starting to melt, but it was, it was pretty intense. Uh, still not driving anywhere because my car is not very high up. So I'm, I'm just chilling, chilling at home for now, working on podcasts, working on work, you know, whatever I do. Um, also, uh, my roommate's dog got sprayed by a skunk. So if, if you need to know what a skunk spray smells like, I can help you out now. And I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but I will carry this weight so that others don't have to. It's, um, it's not, it smells like burnt rubber and eggs, like thrown into a pot. It's not good. So now that you know what's going on with me, what's going on with you? Oh, cool. That's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. Or, oh man, dude, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. Just use whichever one applies and um, just know that I'm here for you. Well, we, <laughs> I talked with uh, my friend Sean Drobish. He's a, he's a game developer. He's really the CEO of Frigate Studios, which is a kind of a grassroots game company. Um, I think around 10 people right now. And they're working on a game called Sigma, which is a competitor to um, Escape from Tarkov. Uh, he, my friend Sean's been a, a, a huge gamer his entire life, really high, he, he streams some too. Uh, huge into Tarkov, but he saw a couple things that he didn't like about it, that he thought that could be improved. Um, and with Tarkov being in that endless beta stage, he decided to take it up on his own. And you'll see what we talk about. I've known him for a while, so I think it takes us about 10 minutes to get into the actual conversation about um, about whatever we talked about, his company and, and hit the game in general. But overall, good conversation, and I had a lot of fun. So let me, uh, let me present to you, and I hope you enjoy episode 45 of The Junk Drawer Show. I'm pretty much good to go. Plus, I like the whole minimalistic, like clean look of the desk. So yeah, your, yours looks a lot better than mine. <laughs> like I'm looking at mine now, <laughs> and my soundboard is huge, and my tower is on mm -hmm. my desk, so it just looks like a clusterfuck. Wait, I got mine's actually like really symmetrical, which I kind of like because I have one PC in the left, one in the right. I have my mouse pad and my keyboard, and then another keyboard, another mouse, and then I have my stream deck in the middle and the three monitors, and it's just like. It's so, plus my knife, my knife. It's so empty yet, like, just, I don't know. It's, it's just very simple and minimalistic. I love it. Is the knife in case you get swatted while you're streaming? No, no, this is in case uh, the dog gets, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> this, is, this is just for opening anything on stream. For example, like, I don't know what it is, but I've had this knife forever and it just never dulls. Really? Like I've, I, I've had it for like seven years. In opening packages, cutting stuff that I probably shouldn't cut with it, it just I don't know. It just stays. It's great. Is it is it like an old great knife? Thing. No, it's um, it's it's made of bone. Like I think it's some type of I don't know bone or some sort. But it's it's just like a normal stainless steel knife. Can you hold it up? Made by camera? yeah, it's, it's, it just says built tough on it. I mean, and it's, it's got not some wrong. type of signature. Yeah, it's stainless steel. Like it's just. Yeah, just, just like a standard knife. Yeah. knife. Mm -hmm. That's wild. I don't know. It, it doesn't, uh, never dulls. Hmm. Perfect. Well, we've been... Quality products we don't get anymore. I know. <laughs> so we have been recording for the past like two minutes, but I'll do an actual like, hey, Sean, thanks mm -hmm. for coming on. I appreciate it. No problem. Uh, no problem. Um, speaking of products that just dull super quickly, I bought a PVC cutter, like one of those crank ones. 
And uh, yeah, yeah. I wish I still had it because the whole I used it a handful of times and it looked like a serrated blade. It went from being a perfectly mm-hmm. smooth one to like serrated and all bent and shit. So don't buy a ten dollar PVC cutter is all I'm all I'm saying. Noted. I, I don't have any PVC to cut at the moment, but I will take that suggestion and get a large saw instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, you are a homeowner now, so you never know what's gonna happen. I guess. Is that, I guess we can call it homeowner. But yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it's, I'm waiting for something to go wrong, but hoping it doesn't. Yeah, that, but, you know, that's the right way to go. How, no. uh, how old is it, the house? The home? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. I'll have to find out. <laughs> I honestly don't know what the house is. It's, uh, I know it's not wood frame, if that means anything. Little... Actually, no, it was... I mean, you kind of know the area. You, you remember when, um, so if you were to go out of the neighborhood that your mom is in, mm-hmm. right? Directly across from it. It's built at the same time those houses were. So it's, a, oh, it's where the same type villages? of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's used that to live type in of those house, too. But, yeah. It's that type of house, like structure, but different location. Okay. So you're probably looking like 80s, maybe 70s, 80s. Yeah, I'd say it's about accurate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the same as mine, and I've only had, like, small stuff go wrong. So. But you've got that, the nice hardwood floor, or the, what's it called, the the stuff that you're, you're sitting on technically right now. What's that, what's that flooring called? Oh, fake? Fake shit? Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> besides fake shit, it's the, um, it's it's what I want to get, basically. It's got, like, almost like the gray tones in it as well, where it's not this, like, orangish, you know? Yeah, yeah, something a little, <clears throat> not warmer, but, like colder i don't know yeah colder more <laughs> clinical you know yeah <laughs> i made everything gray so it feels very stark all the time yeah i mean i I honestly love that type of tiling stuff whatever it's called i can't remember I, it's like poly i don't know whatever it is yeah it is nice i'm glad they did it like they made a fair amount of uh like renovations before they sold the house that were really helpful mm-hmm. like the kitchen a couple windows Actually, all the windows, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got you. I actually, I got kind of lucky with the, they they redid all but like one window. They put hurricane shutters up. He painted a ton of stuff for me just because like, he's like, hey, what color do you want this? He's like painted oh, everything wow. and then kept the paint buckets and put it in the garage for me. So like, I just have all these supplies, of all the stuff he's done. He like, he put up a, like a wood swing bench he redid the deck just like free of charge not in the price of the home nothing like mm-hmm. it's, it's fantastic did you know him beforehand no i did not i didn't oh that's super nice dude mm-hmm. well uh we both have houses now everyone knows so the reason that i brought you on today is you are working on a would you call it a, a hardcore survivalist MMO? Oh, you're muted. A hardcore survival shooter with MMO and RPG aspects, yeah. Okay. So I know there's there, you are limited in what you can talk about, but um, mm-hmm. can you talk about what the game is and how it's different than things that are on the market? Well, the benefit of this is I can say whatever I want because I own the NDA. Oh, okay. But um, let's see, what, what do I want to uh, it's, it's a hardcore shooter heavily anchored to realism or not realism re- to it, heavily anchored to realism without actually tying it into too many realistic factors, therefore creating a more of an immersed environment than a realistic environment. Okay. Um, there are going to be some advanced mechanics and features that aren't seen in most titles out today just due to the complexity and nature of them. And it's going to be built on Unreal Engine. Okay. So can can I talk about the game that kind of spurred it for you? Yeah, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I watched the video uh, on Escape from Tarkov mm-hmm. that you were talking about, um, mm-hmm. where which my understanding of it is that one of the big problems is all the numbers that you would need to actually analyze what you should mm-hmm. use in a given situation is not given to you. 
which yep. seems like what you're talking about, where it's more realistic, <clears throat> but it's not as fun because you just want to know what you have to do, you know? Well, in terms of the, the plethora of information that would be required to make an informed decision in a game, we are actively trying to simplify that without diminishing the experience. Which, so conceptually and through what we've got mechanically so far, it's it's working. But it's it's also extremely tough to correlate things without values into a into programming, for example. Because you have no conceptual basis, you have no mechanical basis for it. Mm -hmm. You just have to kind of have at it and then go go through balancing and, and testing but we're we're, ge we're getting pretty pretty in depth to the most advanced system which would be ballistics at this point in time okay is that what you're working on right now is that the stage in development that you're at yeah we're, we're basically refining ballistics values and refining uh um i can't talk about the other part but we're, we're, yeah we're refining ballistic values yeah <laughs> Okay. So how long have you been working on it now? Ooh. Um, I started working on it by myself in 2019 in July. And then okay. we, I started getting team members around December. That's like, cause July to December was all conceptual refinement. It was all me working in data sheets, trying to get stuff done. And then I got a team up to 14 members, uh, in 2020, but Unfortunately, the whole COVID thing happened and people had to kind of reevaluate what they, what they were doing in their spare time in order to prioritize health and family. Right. So we, I archived the project at that point and reopened it um, in July of 2020. So we had roughly six months of kind of nothing. Um, but now we, we're back up to 11 and we're just having at it. That's wild. Like how, how did you find those 11 to 14 people who who wanted to work on something i'm assuming pro bono yeah it was it's completely a hobby work and to be honest how i got them i have no idea <laughs> i have no i i'm still amazed at the fact that i got one team member to to read the concept that i i proposed say this is something i want to do and then put work unpaid on a project with at that point in time absolutely no return in like finances or anything like they, everything they could put in could be completely gone in a year at that point in time. It just, they were completely okay with it. They were completely okay with working under me and putting that trust in me, did they, which is unfathomable. Yeah. Did, did they, uh, well, I guess I got to ask too, did they, how, mm, how do I word this that you can actually answer? Mm -hmm. Are, fuck it. Are they older than you? Or are they younger than you? Because I, I imagine so, like being you know kind of our age you're a little younger than me mm -hmm. having that leadership position with like let's say someone's 40 it's usually harder for them to want to listen to someone who's almost half their age mm -hmm. it's it it probably feels more weird for me than it does for them yeah i feel like because like for example my project manager uh his name is tanner he's fantastic and he's in his mid-30s and he has way more experience in managing people than i ever will probably mm -hmm. until this thing is off the ground and even my producer is older than i am and it's just kind of a a mutual like respect and it it just kind of works it's like we we i trust what he's doing he trusts what i'm doing and there's a the, it's like two the two the two-way sheet of trust that kind of allows us to do the work that we need to do and then knowing that he is very good at what he does project management wise and that i have done extensive work in refining concepts in putting it into spreadsheets and blah blah blah. it's it's more of a comfort thing i have a lot to learn i'm not saying i know a lot, everything to get this thing going because i definitely don't but it's just yeah it's just kind of the team is currently just basically founded on trust and respect and we have the the skill set per role to get it done it's just kind of a matter of doing it now yeah and that that's like I don't know. It's very much a life goal to to be able to work on a passion project with people that you like. Not only do you like mm -hmm. them, but that they're good at what they do and they have that mutual yeah. respect for you. Like mm -hmm. I've I've been very impressed hearing you talk about it <clears throat> over the past. You know, I I think you were in both fireside chats the past two holidays. Fireside. The the selfish. Oh talks oh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. It's become mm -hmm. like a tradition now, so that's what I'm just calling the podcasts, but. Mm -hmm. um, just hearing you talk about it 
progressively over each year it's it's impressive how much you're doing um mm-hmm. and then when you showed me the the budgeting spreadsheet when i was looking okay. at the airbnb Dude. stuff i was like oh shit you really like you're going <laughs> yeah. ham on this this isn't just like credits and debits you know no yeah that the the discover the discovery driven planning i remember reading a bunch of documents about it and there's even a part of a book i read and then i just went at it and like what do i need to do and i just started blocking everything out in finances and then for example when you approach the airbnb thing i already had my discovery driven planning for the, the studio kickstarter and the studio like pretty much solidified so you're like hey i need this i'm like i just had this document open at the time you were actually talking to me about it i'm like Okay, so I just transferred it over and started renaming fields and filling it out and acquisition costs per tenant and everything that you had, yeah. Yeah. And the it's it's a lot more complex now though, sadly. Oh, I bet. It's it's it's, it's rough. And mine was so simplified compared to what you needed to do cuz mine is just yeah. like setting stuff up and getting the getting a few people. But I'm not even mm-hmm. doing it now. So like it was a really good learning experience, but I just one of my friends mm-hmm. moved in, so it kind of negated the need for it. Um, yeah, I'm, I was. We were actually talking about that yesterday because I, I brought up to your mom that like, oh yeah, I'm talking to Josh tomorrow. We're doing podcasting. He's like, oh okay. He's like, then she brought up the Airbnb thing and like a, a correlated conversation. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh yeah, he's no longer doing it. I, I joke. He's like, after all of that work, <laughs> he's not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I kind of heard about that through the uh, family the family tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's still something yeah. I want to do, but it's it's delayed. You know, it's just easier to have, and it helped him move out of the place that he was at. So eventually Mm -hmm. when I get those uh, 1,400 Biden bucks, maybe that'll be enough. Mm -hmm. We'll see. That's supposed to be coming in like a week, right? I think so. I I read that it could have been as soon as this weekend, but I haven't gotten it yet. Mm -hmm. So not this weekend. Yeah, I haven't gotten it either, to be honest. So yeah, we'll see. Um, But back to your game. Can you tell me about... Mm -hmm. I guess the journey over the past two and a half years from when you first realized you wanted to do it and then how you got to where mm-hmm. you are now with the team and everything. It's, and break all your yeah, NDAs. Yeah, break, break them all. But um, yeah, that was a, it's been a rough journey. And I have, like, like you know, every, everyone has doubts, right? Mm-hmm. I, I specifically remember like one, I'll get, actually I'll get to that later. But anyway, start, uh, starting the, the company it actually was i was playing a game called satisfactory made by coffee stain studios <clears throat> and it's always been like a, a mental gymnastics thing for me with because i it's it's almost like i challenged myself to do a bunch of math with like rates per minute just to have fun and build in a factory build a game and i was talking to someone because we were playing co-op on it and we just got on the topic of game development like the state of the industry and like what what's not what what um what genre is not really progressing? Which one's really progressing? For example, battle royales at that point were like blowing up and constantly being innovated. And um, we decided like we should just you know conceptually brainstorm for a, a hardcore shooter. So we did, and then um, we kind of was like, you want to make a game? We just want to just like try this because like Unreal Engine's free. Unity is pretty much free as well until you get to the selling point. And we looked into the the licensing fees for Unreal and the Steam distribution costs, and we're like, yeah, let's, let's take a shot. What's the worst that could happen? We don't sell it, and we just so yeah, we we just did it. Mm-hmm. And then um, it the name of the studio came from like, want to make a game? Fuck it, let's make a game. So it just came Frigate Studios. And then um, that's great. From there, <laughs> yeah, just some, sometimes you do have to be unprofessional in a professional setting. It's it's part of the fun in my mind like we don't want to be like that you know uptight company who's always doing something because it's how it's been done for years and blah 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 yeah it's it so sets we, the tone for the culture of the company like you're not gonna exactly you're not gonna be super rigid if your name is like <laughs> fuck off studios you know yeah exactly exactly like um the i actually brought this up in a team meeting that we had recently um where we're we're, t- we're aiming for the type of atmosphere it's just gonna sound really bad, but I'll explain it in a second. Of like Wolf of Wall Street, where like it's it's that like really relaxed. The, like everyone in the company like pretty much really knows each other, and they're it's it's not this like super professional environment. Everyone has to be this way, act this way, or else this like is gonna happen. Blah blah blah. But we're also not you know doing crack and <laughs> heroin and smoking and having hookers come in an office type of setting yet. But we we want to have that you know 
For example, like right now we have studio game nights where we all just get together and we play whatever game, even if it's not applicable to what we're doing. But in the future, we want to have like, we're going to fly um, the developers out for like a weekend or something and just go somewhere, do something like awesome and just have that type of more of like a family connection as developers instead of like a, a company connection where it's like, oh, you're employees, I'm the boss, blah, 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 type of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the goal for the company atmosphere. We, we don't want to be that uptight company. You're almost like a, uh, but, um, like a co-op, you know? where the, what do you mean so like a, a co-op is it's a, it's a structure but it's less hierarchical so even if you were mm-hmm. I, mean, I think co-op is the right term but like you may be in charge of like telling people what to do but you don't necessarily mm-hmm. have authority over them or you have it but it's not like a you must do what i say it's more of a whether you're a manager or a developer you're on the same mm-hmm. tier but you just have different skill sets that require the developers to listen to what you say yeah, I mean, it, for, like I, I've talked to my my project manager and producer in the sense that we, one thing I really want to avoid in total is that if, if there's a disagreement in the studio, it, for example, like if if a programmer disagrees with the concepts, they bring it to the senior programmer, right? Mm-hmm. We don't want it to be like, well, just do it because, you know, I told you to. We want it to be kind of like a, more of like an open discussion instead of like, well, I'm the boss is what I said. So how about we just do it and stop talking about it? Yeah. And we don't want to have that type of atmosphere because it just doesn't seem like a, a good idea in total. But there are, and plus I've experienced that side of it as well, where it's kind of, you know, I don't agree with this, but can we, you know, maybe figure something like, no, just I told you what to do, do it. Mm-hmm. So I, Yeah. I, don't know, I may have gotten off topic because my brain kind of just like died for a second. But oh, anyway, no, that's fine. This is this is very much just a meandering conversation. So just go wherever where you, wherever your brain tells you to go. I don't know about that one. <laughs> okay, well, ninety uh, percent of the places. Ninety percent, yeah. But um, but yeah, like the journey of the studio. Going back to that, um, we founded it. We I did a bunch of work conceptually, and then we got some people on. Had a fantastic senior programmer who I wish would come back, but he got a job at a big, big studio, so he's he's pretty much there mm-hmm. and not and not moving because obviously making pretty good money. And it's hard to program for two companies at once, but um, yeah, but yeah, he um did some great works. So we have a great foundation of that that he worked on, and then um, we recently are really overhauling art, but during when we had, when I shut down for. Uh, the team not being able to really do work for, with COVID going on. That was hard. It's telling 14 team members that are like dedicated to the project, didn't want to have to leave. And then they had to give family reasons. And I just archived it. Mm-hmm. That talk about like crippling doubt, dude. I, that was I, like, there's like, we, we just put all this work in. I, I I have these developers who are really, really wanting to get this done. And now I'm saying we're archiving it. It will resume it when everyone can come back. I, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm still gonna try it. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna just put my hands up and be like, done. But I did not expect to come back from it. Wow. So, at all. so you waited six months before mm-hmm. talking to the team again? We, well, we stayed in contact. We okay. still, I had still the Discord open. Um, we, we would still like chat and like just, I like in a, on a friendly level. Mm-hmm. But um, when I went to reopen the studio with, uh, well, reopen the team, be like, okay, so. We're, we can all come back. We're good to go. We just have to re-sign legal documents for NDAs and all this other stuff just to make sure we're all financially and legally covered. Um, I only had like three developers come back out of the 14. Wow. Because they, cause they, some of them, like they just, like for example, one of them didn't have a Discord account anymore. The uh, well, Another one of them, like my senior programmer got a job at a big studio during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, lead sound, uh, left for a different project because we had to archive it. So we, I lost like a bunch of like the people who were like my right hand man type of person. Mm -hmm. So we had three and then I got my project manager, Tanner and my producer, Eric, who mostly Tanner, Eric is recent, but Tanner, like once I got him, it just exploded. Like we had a massive influx of members and a massive influx of applications on our form. Was, was Tanner an old team member or he's new to the second like iteration of of work he was new to the second iteration which is actually kind of a funny story because 
I've actually known him for seven years or so. Okay. He we knew each other when I was like, no, hold on. Like eight years, because he, he knew me when I was like 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Back when I was like playing uh, PUBG, like near semi-professionally. And he he was under a different name and on Discord. And he just, I stumbled across his stream, started talking. And then he's like, you know, we know each other, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, we don't. <laughs> I, can, I can assure you I've never met you. Then he told me his other name. I'm like, oh shit, this, Wow. Like it's a blast from the past. And then he heard about what I was doing through a mutual friend. So he DM'd me privately off stream and just talked to me about what I'm doing, like what concepts are. And he's like, you know, I'm in project manager for construction, blah, 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 blah. And then since then he's been my project manager. Oh, wow. And he just like helped grow the team exponentially. So do, do mm -hmm. you find that a lot of your uh, team members do the same thing professionally? No, actually. Okay. Uh, for example, our concept artist it works in a hospital. Oh. Um, I I work in a hospital. I'm not a CEO. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, like looking at my list of team members, the only one that does the same thing that they do, in only two that do the same thing that they do, and and like for their real jobs are my community manager, who actually is like a marketing strategist, mm -hmm. and then my composer, who's a professional not a professional composer, but a composer. Wow. That's cool that, mm -hmm. that people are getting a chance to flex their hobbies and something that could be, you know, a future job. Assuming that mm -hmm. this goes as well as, as I think it will, just know, knowing you for as long as I have and the way that you, like, dive into things and then seeing those goddamn spreadsheets mm -hmm. and how intense they yeah. were. Like, Dude, you're, you're going hard. Those you're going hard with it. I, I kind of, I, I always have the mentality of if I want to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put like everything I have in there and I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it. Mm -hmm. But, um, this is like a whole nother level to that. Cause I mean, it's, it's no longer this, you know, um, it's not like me trying to get good at a game or me trying to learn something. It's me trying to learn how to do financial budgeting and planning, financial management on a higher, way higher level. And then also to do, uh, like, to make to basically create legal documents and also have it appropriate and accurate and then have that checked by uh some a legal person obviously like later on and then also learn t team management which is not easy mm -hmm. and project management which is insanely tough which i don't have to, don't have to do too much of that anymore then on top of that i have to fill in every single role that we don't have so like i've the only thing i haven't learned is uh, 3d art and animation everything else like programming like concept art like just really good writing sound development like i've had to learn and do all of that so like now i can actually assist in all areas of the team which is an awesome experience to be honest yeah i can imagine i mean i don't th i think a lot of people don't realize how much time and energy goes into being in charge of something like this like uh, yeah. games you know, are a Herculean task on their own, but just being mm -hmm. in charge of more than two people, trying to manage it, keep them happy, make sure the project moves forward, keep the morale up. Like it's, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you know, short, like at your age is, is a lot. Like I, I've done it with like two hard. or three people and I'm like this, I can see how this gets rough. Yeah. Like we, like I said, we've got 11 right now and it's, just for example, looking at the Discord, there's like seven categories, and each category has a minimum of three channels. Mm -hmm. And then we have I have my workflow management software. I have my accounts, like all my spreadsheets for legal, all my all my spreadsheets for data and conceptual. Like it's so much to manage. And if I didn't discover it's gonna sound weird, but Google Calendar when I did, mm -hmm. and also the workflow management tool that I did, and also Tanner when I did. Yeah. This would be a completely different ball game right now. Like I'd be struggling to to do the um, the project management and also do the legal and financial, because legal is a whole another animal by itself. It's crazy how actually how difficult legal stuff is. I bet I felt like legals. It's like programming with a very sloppy language, because you have mm -hmm. to write rules that yeah. people can't break. But because rules mean different things <laughs> to different people, it's so easy to to either accidentally write in loopholes or forget something mm -hmm. 
like for example, like if I pull up my workflow management tool right now, there's um the one the one role we don't have uh, that's kind of going to be pivotal later on is an HR manager. Oh yeah. And like we're talking about because we're in a remote international company at the moment who's going to have a physical location soon. So we have to have like warning and termination documents, employee handbooks, rules, regulations, and protocols, hiring remote foreign employees and documentation on that. Um, new developer applications and like contracts all remade for the actual official studio thing with all the junk it has to have mm -hmm. employee files and like everything. It's, it's just, it's crazy how much work actually goes into the legal side of it. Yeah. So is it a, you said hiring international employees mm -hmm. was a form. Is it different yep. for each country or is it just a blanket thing the U S has? Um, I think it's more of a blanket. I, again, I don't know. That's why I have them I have to have them research it, yeah, but I think it's more advice. of a, a blanket. Yeah. Do, do not take anything I say and don't do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's more of a like blanket thing. It's kind of like a work visa for the United States. Oh, okay. In a sense. Okay. But they don't come over but, here. Um, they just, they stay working where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. And then one thing actually I'm talking to my producer about is um, the... Like, for example, um, if you're an employee in, a, in any U.S.-based company, you have taxes taken out and you have, you know, Social Security for, okay, like whatever else benefits you have, right? Mm -hmm. With international employees, you don't have to offer benefits. You don't have to, uh, you, don't, you don't pay taxes on them either. And uh, they don't take, social, obviously, obviously, Social Security because it's a different country. Yeah. But you, the company gets taxed for it in turn and you have to figure out kind of like what you're going to do for it's... It's a bunch of little weird inconsistencies, but also it might vary country to country because there might be some, you know, something in there because it's legal stuff. And, you know, I never know what the fuck is what. But yeah, but yeah, so it's interesting how it works with remote employees in different countries. Yeah. So so do you have mentors or anyone that you go to with these questions or is it all Google? Nope. Uh, well, so anything legal, I go to my producer as an MBA. Okay. And then anything project management, I go to my my actual project manager Tanner, who has um, just insane years in estimating, budgeting, and team management. Because he he manages teams of like, he since he's a construction project manager, he does the estimating on multi million dollar budgets, mm -hmm. spreads that through departments, for like what role has to do what, like electrical, whatever they have for construction. I don't know. I'm not, but, yeah. um, and then also they have, um, so he, he manages, I think it's called the for, their foremans mm -hmm. and then the foremans have their team as well. And he manages all of that in budget, manpower and, uh, time. Wow. Yeah. I see what you're saying about if you hadn't found Tanner, it would be totally mm -hmm. different. It is amazing how the people yeah. you just, you know, not arbitrarily, but serendipitously find. Like without mm -hmm. those people that you don't have the building blocks you need to get to where you want to go. Yeah. Like it's just pure coincidence that I, I jump into a stream. He's there. He DMs me. And then, you know, what is it? Eight months later now or something like that. Nine. Say we had a baby nine months. Yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he, he's just, he's here just kicking ass on the team. Did he, so did he <laughs> recognize you by name or by voice, by face? What was by it? name? Name. So you've had the yeah, same name for the, long. Yeah, I've had, had, have had Doc Soup 143 for about, since I was 13, actually. Dang. So it's like 11 years, yeah. yeah. I've changed like five different times within that time frame. Yeah, now, now you're an alphabet. I'm an alphabet? <laughs> it's on Discord. Yeah, that was because when I was raiding, we had to have our in-game name. Now mm -hmm. I go by Swell Fella with a second A because yes, yes. the first one without it was taken so you do what you can with what you have mm -hmm. yeah that's true uh i remember one of my old friends had the whole uh xi his name then ix at the end of the old xbox oh, gamer yeah. tag <laughs> thing yeah gotta do what you gotta do to get those names xx underscore god yeah <laughs> or lowercase x capital x lowercase x and then the name and then yeah god xbox was a disaster yeah some of the names were so bad yeah. Uh, so where where were we at in the journey? I think you were just talking about coming back after the COVID, or well, you were talking oh, about oh, crippling COVID. doubt. Yeah, crippling doubt. Tell me about that. Yeah, six crippling month doubt. <laughs> crippling doubt period. 
Yeah, so we, it was just, it, it was honestly hard for me to work on the project. I, when I say project, I mean the game. Mm -hmm. This is what this is what we refer to it as. But um, yeah, working on like opening spreadsheets and just doing financials was just a burden. And I had to, I like, I made myself do it because I knew if I didn't now and it took off, then I would be the one who didn't put the effort in. Mm -hmm. And I, when it's, if I'm making a company, I don't want to be that person. So I just put everything I had, sat there, blasted some music, did financial spreadsheets, did ammo calculations with all this stuff, researched all these weapons that I could, compiled a list of companies we have to contact for legal, like as much as I could do in this like time of not working in engine and then also optimizing doing file organization in engine updating it to the next version and just doing whatever i could and now when we got the team and it started to pick up traction again it was everything was better than we left it because i had six months to go in and do stuff on my spare time mm -hmm. and then from then it's just just i don't know just history in a sense we um we've constantly getting new members we've been slowly progressing through the the tough things like, uh, for example, like re last week, we had a catastrophic issue with software. Unreal Engine, we upgraded to 4.26 and uh, a our, our sound software, FMOD, mm -hmm. did, was not compatible with the new version of Unreal. So everything was broken. And I spent probably about eight hours in a call in total with the sound team over the last week, just figuring out what we could do to get this working. So we removed FMOD, removed every bit of audio, which set us back a little bit, but now it's fixed so we can just revert the project and update it. So we're good to go. Source control. <laughs> so, so wait, so you rolled back? Did you roll back um, Unreal Engine? No, no, we, so um, with the server, so the server hosting service that we're using, um, I can create snapshots of the the current version, and also I download the a copy of the the, the current stable build that we have, mm -hmm. and then save that in a hard drive. So that way, if something happens to the server, I have a backup right here, and if something happens here, I have a backup on the server. Gotcha. So what are you but, um, what are you using for source or version control? Do you have a GitHub like a private repository? In a sense, yes. So we don't use GitHub for the fact that LFS is a pain, apparently, for me. What is LFS? Uh, it's it might just be for me. Uh, large file storage. Oh, okay. It's GitHub large file storage, but um, I I just couldn't get it to work. I tried Source Tree. I tried just Git, and then the the program I was originally using uh, that I found that was super compatible with Unreal Engine was uh, something called Perforce. Okay. It's um it's very expensive software. Um, once you kind of uh, get past like the free stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, that is a lifesaver. It's not the best UI, but it works. And it integrates with Unreal flawlessly. It, like Unreal, you just go and click, click, and then you type in the username, type in the password, select the workspace, and you're in. It's done, and it syncs. Oh, nice. And, then, and there's also something, it probably works in Git this way too, but you can right-click an asset, for example, like an animation or a blueprint in Unreal, and hit checkout, it locks the file for everybody else on the team and says that you're editing it. So that way when you're done, you hit submit, type in the change notes, and it sends it and unlocks it for the team with the updated version. Okay. That is super so helpful. So that's been, yeah, it's been insanely helpful. I, and plus, um, there's no file um, size limit at all. So I can upgrade like an eight gigabyte, one single file, and a server will take it, no problem. Wow. I forget about that, that the files might be too big for certain things. Like seeing things mm -hmm. like Call of Duty where, what is it, 200 gigabytes? I don't even I don't even know Dude, how it's like you 250. Do that. Is it 250 now? How do you what it, are you doing? I mean, let me phrase it this way. It's so bad. You know, I'm just gonna find it real quick. It's it's so bad that Call of Duty Cold War um made a NVMe drive for their game. Here I have actually it's right here. Let me let me pull this up real quick for you. Like they made an NVMe <laughs> Call of Duty oh Black Ops Cold War drive. Like, if that's not a sign that your game is too big, I don't know what is. Well, like, what do you even... Like, what is it? What what makes it so big? Like, I don't know. How big is Tarkov, for example? Nine gigabytes. Okay. So they don't need 250 gigabytes. Like, what are they doing? No. I mean, in, unless they just really, really, really want audio quality. Because, like... Remember Titanfall? 
Uh, I remember the. I never played it, but I remember the game. So um, when I first downloaded Titanfall on PC a long time ago, um, it. It, I, I made fun of the fact I was. Uh, I remember it vividly. And I called my cousin, and we made fun of the fact it was 52 gigabytes because most games were like under 30 at that point in time, mm-hmm. like almost everything. And we found out it was 52 gigabytes of I think sound files. Like the sound folder was just insanely massive. Okay. And I think that well, in Titanfall's case, it was a combination of things, but mostly the sound files, like insanely big. So what Call of Duty might have done, I haven't gone through files, so I. Not 100 percent sure on this at all, but um, wave file formats can be large. Yeah. So if they have everything in a wave file format, that's audio from footsteps to ambience to gunshots to whatever. Mm-hmm. That, especially if it's high quality, that really really adds up. So for example, like we're using wave file formats for stuff like music where it needs to be high quality. Mm-hmm. But stuff that doesn't need to be high quality, we're using OGG because it's condensed, it's compressed, and it's small, mm-hmm. and it reduces file size. So that could be why Call of Duty is that big. But it doesn't mean you need a terabyte NVMe drive to just sell your game to it. Like it comes with some other like bonuses, I think probably like some type of in-game currency. But still, like if that's not a sign that your game is too big, I don't know what is. Yeah. Well, it's almost like we're going back to physical media. You know, (laughs) it's like the game got so big that it's like, well, fuck it. Let's just sell hard drives and flash drives, whatever it needs to be. I remember I remember God of War had two discs. I forgot which one I had. It It was on uh, PS2. Yeah, one of the PS2 versions did. It uh, it was like disc one and you got to this bridge and there were wings flapping beneath the bridge. And then you're supposed to go there and put the second disc in and then it resumes that point. But mine was broken, so I never did it. So I never finished the game. Oh, that sucks. But um. But I was like, why are, there, why are there two discs? Like, like, But yeah. I was a big Final Fantasy kid in uh, the PlayStation 1 days. So I was very mm-hmm. used to that because all of I think all the games that were on PlayStation were at least three discs. So it felt like reading a chapter book. Yeah. It's like you get to the next stage like, oh, yeah, fuck it. I did it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I was okay with two discs, and that was Call of Duty uh black ops zombies i think it was because zombies is like its own separate disc or something like that i forgot Mm -hmm. but um i was like okay that's fine it's like a its own you know section of this game but but yeah it's speaking of uh the old playstations star wars battlefront 2 still slams dude dude i've been playing the old version yeah yeah i've been playing that with uh some of my friends like every thursday or so Mm -hmm. i'm very bad the the new one or the old one still I think it's the old one. I don't. It was whatever was free on Epic. Oh, that's that's the new the one. New one. Okay, that's the new one. I'm talking the old one made in 2001. Oh shit! No, I haven't. Pl- that one's still mm-hmm. good. Still holds up. That dude. That one slams. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't played it in forever, but it's awesome. Like they they it, like if you play that and then like not not include the graphics. The graphics are terrible because right. it's you know 2001. But <clears throat> dude, it was so good, so good. Yeah, it's is that that's the game like i grew up on it was awesome like you could just go through and have these open like war fights and now now it's kind of closed and restricted but what do you expect from ea yeah (laughs) that's gonna cost money now yeah i I didn't have high standards to be honest so have you did kind of a jump but have you done any vr yet do do you mess with it much Mm -mm. i've actually never put on a vr headset but i have put on the uh What's it called? Oh, I can't remember the name of this. It's the the Microsoft Hololens. I've I've used Hololens though. Okay. I have I haven't used VR yet. Okay, because w- the reason I thought of it is my roommate's pretty big into VR, um, and he 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 found some mod for for a game. I don't know what it was. Have you watched Attack on Titan? No, but I've 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 seen part of it. Okay, so you know the the basic idea is that you're like a small, regular sized human fighting these Titan people. Like that are like, you know, between yeah, yeah. five and 60 meters tall. So I tried mm-hmm. doing VR with that and he put me into Mouse Isley. So it was like a Battlefront mm-hmm. 2 map, but I was able to like Spider-Man around while trying to slash the back of their necks. It was, it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what it made me think of that like VR has all that capability for games like Battlefront 2 and I don't know. Mm-hmm. It made me sick also. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I can't put the headset on <laughs> for very long, but mm-hmm. it, uh. I really like the potential that it has. 
VR has a lot of potential. I feel like they haven't really hit what they've what VR is needed for and really could be good for though. Like the first person shooters in VR, like they're they're clunky. They're they're cool, but they're clunky. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that it needs to be kind of, you know, um, I f I feel like they're looking at it without taking a step back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they're taking what they're doing at face value. They're not like backing up. Like okay, what can this product actually do? And then find an application for it. So personally, I don't think VR is going to be used for uh, gaming going forward, just because it's. It's it's a it's kind of a pain. You have to dedicate a room to it if you really want to have like a good setup. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't see that being like a good commercial gaming product going forward unless they completely innovate it. But for example, like the Hololens, like that would be a good commercial product going forward because it's augmented reality. There's no you have to do anything crazy in your environment. You can just you can go anywhere if it's like innovative and perfected enough. Yeah, that's that's actually what I was gonna say. Is that I think that AR is the much more applicable technology to day to day mm -hmm. because you're right vr yeah. having to have a whole like 10 by 10 space so you're not like hitting things like mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have an entire room that they can just dedicate yeah like for example i don't unless i completely take apart my desk and my setup that i just built so yeah <laughs> i'm definitely not gonna do that what i do find cool are um are games like uh carly and the reaper man we my room i haven't even heard of that it's pretty cool so it's a it's a platformer game and one person plays on the pc or on the tv with a regular controller and it's just a 3d platformer mm -hmm. but then you have someone in the vr okay. headset that is uh the reaper man and they have the ability mm -hmm. to control certain platforms and like pick it up move it so that carly can then jump from place to place so oh gotcha so that's okay. really good because like i was playing it uh like two nights ago with my roommate and he was just sitting in a chair but he was you know had this kind of god omnipotent perspective and then i'm just sitting on the couch mm -hmm. playing but there wasn't all this flailing around that he had to do so he wasn't like hitting the ceiling or anything mm -hmm. and i think that's where vr is gonna uh thrive as a game you know yeah things that you don't like have to I, I could also, much i could also see vr like i I, this is more of a HoloLens thing that I saw, but it could be pretty cool for VR too. So, um, do you remember the old HoloLens showcase where they were like shooting spiders on the wall or something, and they, then they had the Minecraft one where the Minecraft thing built on the desk, and they could put TNT on their wall and break it, and you see a Minecraft world behind it. No, but that's really cool. <clears throat> yeah, so like something with that, like so someone who, like I'm not a big Minecraft person, but someone who is, and someone who knows how to mod and develop for both both PC and both. Uh, AR software, they could do something where, you know, the, the, the person wearing VR would be like this God entity or some, or have some type of game master control over the environment. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you have the players who are still in that 3d environment on a PC or whatever, and they can, the person can just literally like scroll the world and do whatever they want while the players are still doing what they would normally do in Minecraft. So that could be a good application to it, but it would just determine, sorry, it would just, you know, depend on who wants to develop that, who, if it's a good idea, cost whole studio stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it is, uh -huh. it's so, it's so new and so clunky uh -huh. that you have to really uh -huh. have a passion for it because like you said, a lot of the, the games are not, uh -huh. they're, they're, dis they're like cramming it into the VR space as opposed to taking what uh -huh. VR is good at and like building out from there. But I think you have yeah. to, like, you have to take known IP or known concepts and like mm -hmm. jam it into this, like jam the square peg into the circle hole so that people mm -hmm. are interested or just aware in what's even possible. And then over time, yeah. people will start building from like the ground up. And I mean, that, that actually reminds me of, of something I saw recently. It was actually, uh, from four years ago, it was, so, it was, uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson addressing the Senate regarding NASA's budget. Oh, or not. I remember that. I remember that video. <clears throat> yeah. And it, his whole thing was about um, being on the frontier of, you know, science and astrophysics and development and then having the, and therefore creating innovation in, a com in the American communities and in turn also creating spinoffs from NASA. Like, for example, handheld power tools are a spinoff from NASA's research. Mm -hmm. So, like, <clears throat> it, if we were to have something like that in the game industry, someone like really pushing the frontier, then that would also strive for, that would also naturally create innovation in the industry as well. 
do you know well let's bring it back to hardcore survival do you who Mm -hmm. is there anyone out there that you admire that's really pushing the industry in a direction that you want it to go or nope nope. it's you (laughs) there's no one out there (laughs) that's why you're doing it i mean i hope so yeah so yeah so also the 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 company was kind of made out of anger in a sense of like why is nobody caring about this genre that is so underdeveloped that is so much innovation so much on the frontier that hasn't been discovered in the last 10 years like we have day z which goes back to arma 2 Mm -hmm. we have tarkov which goes back to beta in 2015 2016 which that's a catastrophe the beta was i mean it's still in beta oh it oh it's one of those games it's one of those games yep that's that's a different topic (laughs) that that's the kind of like a more that's that's really when you get the boiling you know anger do you feel like but um you can rant I think we got like I mean, 45 minutes before you got to go. So <laughs> feel free to use 40 of it, those. Let me just say that the, the COO of Battlestate Games, Nikita, something in Russian, not the address name, um, did a PowerPoint presentation in 2013 or something like that. It was a while ago, years ago, um, regard, uh, at some Russian convention. And he talked about stuff um, in his previous uh, web browser uh, like browser-based first-person shooter uh contract wars which is now a steam game okay. and he talked about like the audience was asking questions he talked about you know the pay to win mechanics in the game like it's basically you pay to be better mm-hmm. like not better as in mechanically better like you're giving benefit but paid to be higher on the scoreboard and perceived as better so it kind of it's it's kind of like one of those weird situations and then after that he talked about is it because you're you're buying better weapons or what makes you mm-hmm. You're just literally buying your space on the leaderboard. Practically, yeah. It's it's kind of it's really weird. I did, I haven't played the game, so I don't know the the actual like the the actual purchases you make. Mm-hmm. But what like he he said that you the per, the end game purchases would like actually improve the the rank on the leaderboard and improve your like I think it's almost like a score booster type deal, something like that. Okay, but. <clears throat> It's pay to win in a sense. And then he also talked about um, endless beta syndrome, the pros and cons. Hmm. And the pros were that you could you could write off issues in the game with a beta tag. <laughs> which, not to try to say they're doing that, which they are, but... <laughs> yeah. You know, and then there's... it. It's, it's just a great, great presentation, to be honest. That sounds and like... Not, not in a good way, but in like a learning capacity like what they're doing yeah that that sounds like one of those things that someone would have said in the 90s not expecting it to be Mm -hmm. recorded forever and then Mm -hmm. but to say that in like 2015 is kind of insane just to straight up say yeah um our game is incomplete and we're just gonna pawn it off as a beta for the next six years yeah i mean like uh i can probably find the actual quote too but um he it was something along the lines of that he let me, let me, I pulled the document. Let me just find it. It's super easy to find in here. Okay. Um, so yeah, he, he talked about the eternal open beta syndrome. The pros were fuck-ups and imperfections of the game that could be written off with the beta status. Cons, you can't keep it up forever. People will start leaving. Exact quote. I mean, he's not wrong. So, I mean, it's he's not wrong, but it's um, it's just a really shitty way to do business. Yeah, it... it looks like it's very much a money driven thing as opposed to a passion for the project which is what you really want someone who loves yeah. the thing they're making and the money is just a a byproduct because mm-hmm. i mean if if you really strive for quality and you really want to make a product that the community is going to love and your heart's in it you're most likely going to make profit to sustain doing that as long as like as long as your heart's in the right place and your mind's in the right place and you have the right target you're pretty much going to do well I mean, it's it's it sucks that people with malintent still do well and they kind of ruin things. But it, I don't know. We'll see what happens with this company. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. yeah. You are still yeah. very much in the early stages, but I mean, mm-hmm. the fact that you made it through the pandemic and at least most of it, and in those six months, you you made it better on your own. You know, you put the whole mm-hmm. thing on your back. It's like, okay, I'm, you know. I have a lot of doubt, but people might come back. And if they come back, I want to make sure that it's in a place that they can just keep going mm-hmm. like that. That says a lot. And, and I really think it's indicative of how successful 
you will be in, in whatever way, whether you define mm -hmm. success as just releasing the game or creating a studio from it, or even just completing the project, you know, I think you'll definitely make it. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole reason it's, it's going to sound, it's, it's kind of going to sound bad, but it's in a, it's in a good light is that the only reason I'm gonna get this out is to make the money. Because you make the money, you can hire developers who are passionate about what they're doing and you can make a better product. Mm -hmm. And, it, and you, can't, you can't have a team without, you can't, you can't have a team of employees without having money involved. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to have the mindset of, you can't, I can't do this until I profit from it. Because that way when you profit from it, you can then pay everyone who's now passionate about it to stay. Because if, if we stay like this, we're never gonna get anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's, Period in a story. If we don't ask for money, if we don't make money, we're done. We might as well just pack it up and quit now. Yeah, like you have to have the capital, and you you mm -hmm. want to be able to reward passion as opposed to just skill. You know. Yeah. Well, the the you have to have the skill and the will to do it. If you don't have one, if you don't have one, you're probably not going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> like if 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 you don't have the skill, sorry. If you just so you don't if you don't have the will to improve your product, you're not going to make it. If you have the skill to improve it, you can only get so far. You have to have both to actually succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's a huge balancing okay. act. But the way you're talking mm -hmm. about structuring your company, I think that that <clears throat> keeps the will up. You know, mm -hmm. like a lot of I I've been like, in in situations where I've gotten into a team. You know, five six years ago, and mm -hmm. like I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna be awesome. I'm super I'm so excited. And then something about the culture or just the way that things are run, mm -hmm. like ah, I don't want to do this anymore. And just it kills <laughs> your motivation. It sucks. Yeah, like for example, um. A, a good ex, a good example that I can think of is that it's like we actually the one that I actually had in in this uh, in my in my company mm -hmm. we the first team meeting where we had above ten people everyone was like scared like because I I would talk and talk about like what we're doing well, we we really try to preach transparency first of all like they they or the team doesn't know what I'm doing and they don't know what the project manager and producer are doing so they don't need to know the details of it mm -hmm. but. Whenever my producer's done with a legal task or my project manager's done with, you know, setting a budget, the team knows about it. They're like, okay, so this is, we've been quiet because of this. This is what we've been doing. And there's a transparency from a developer to CEO level on everything. Mm. And I remember that first meeting, everyone was like scared. Like they were like, I'm sorry, they're quiet. Like they were scared to talk or ask questions or whatever. And that's when I met with, uh, Tanner regarding like we need to figure something out to get the team casual and talking because I don't want to seem like they're talking to their boss all the time mm -hmm. so like we started just becoming way more casual in meetings just bringing up topics talking about whatever the team wanted to talk about while also getting our points across for like legal financial and project management like we have expectations but we're not going to make it like you know a board meeting where the employees sitting there just hands in their lap just watching quietly yeah. type of thing it's like we we want to have that open environment where for example the, t the team can be like yeah that was fucking stupid like you just kind of go off and like there's not not an expectation to constantly be professional unless you're in the public eye type of thing yeah like you're you're trusting the employees enough that they they can understand context you know mm -hmm. closed doors whatever yeah. say whatever you want but you know mm -hmm. which is go ahead rules as long as we're within rules and regulations what we have to operate on we're pretty much good to go like we don't want to be overly casual because that's where problems start to happen yeah we don't want to be we don't want to be strict where it's like okay now it's it's like a chore to go to work and they don't want to be there they don't they don't like the person that is you know they're they're underneath the leads like we want to have that open environment yeah open <laughs> respectful mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. oh man yeah the snow is real bad right now <laughs> like i can't see past oh, my neighbor's same house. dude no I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. that florida <laughs> snow yeah, it's like 76 degrees of snowing. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's crazy. That, like that's 80. just dandruff, dude. Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's the ceiling. Do you have it's supposed to be ceiling? inside, right? Yeah, I think so. No. <laughs> but no, it's um, it's not popcorn ceiling, but it's almost like a popcorn ceiling. I don't know how to explain it, to be honest. I don't. When it comes to like physical items, like construction terms, I'm not your guy. Oh, <laughs> is it just like paint? Like textured paint? Maybe. Like if you were to rub your like hand it, it, on it, would it fall off? No, no. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah, probably like textured paint. Yeah. Let's go with that. It's, it sounds good. I like that one. If and if not, Ship it. no one can see your roof right or your ceiling right now, so we're just gonna say that <laughs> that's that's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. It's snowing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um. 
So let's see what did did we finish the the story up till now of what what is your game? It's Fricket Fricket Studios. Fricket Studios. Fricket Studios. Yeah. Have have we have we finished the the story of Fricket Studios from inception to now? Pretty much, yeah. Because like, there's not much to talk about now, unless you want to get like really in depth to um, the the studio going goings on stuff like that. Like, which I can't talk about due to NDA. But, <laughs> then, uh, no, um, I don't want to. You'll talk probably about it. you'll probably hear about that off the record. Yeah. But um, but yeah, it's more of a um, it's just more of kind of we're just chugging along, getting what we can do done, and working through the tasks that we have set out to get this thing uh, like gameplay loop ready. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about other hardcore survival games out there? I want to I want to know. Like the one that I'm most interested in is um I think is it called Val- Valheim? Valheim? Valheim. Because it's That's it, actually a game, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go. So it, rant. I'm rant. Oh, I actually don't know too much about it because it's a it's a top-down like 3D. It's like you know how you can zoom out and you have like almost a top-down but it's like tilted slightly. Mm-hmm. And then you can zoom in, you're like right behind the character. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. Um, it's more of a... It's it's pretty much a survival game from what I've seen. I haven't played it yet. But um, it's an older 2D art style. Like, it's an older art style using more... Sp- not sprites. Um, just not a realistic art style, so I can say. Mm-hmm. It's more cartoony and kind of relaxed type of game. But um, it's it seems to be like if you took a... A game like the forest at its core or minecraft something like that mm-hmm. and just made it vikings and then took some runescape and put it in and that's valheim that's kind of what it seems like on a surface level yeah that's actually why i got interested one of the runescape uh content creators that i follow did like a 20 minute video of him just playing with friends and it it does mm-hmm. feel like runescape meets elder scrolls online meets like i don't know minecraft maybe something where you can collaborate mm-hmm. with people and that seems super yeah, fun, yeah. you know. Like that—that's what I like. I don't want the the modern guns and and like ballistics for me personally. That's just not my game style. Mm-hmm. But I do like the oh, I cut a tree and now my wood cutting's better, you know. Yes, I I'm I really like the I like the games that aren't fun. That, that's that's me. You like the games that aren't fun. Yep. <laughs> okay, so you like work. No, no. Well, I mean. Technically, yeah, I do like work at the moment yeah. because I'm creating a game. But um, but yeah, like I, when I say not fun, you have to really evaluate what the definition of fun is, right? Mm-hmm. So when it, the the reason I use the word fun is because most people find fun with entertainment, right? Mm-hmm. Like if they're entertained, if they're having a great time, they're having fun. I look for games that are physical, not physically, like mentally challenging and that literally will beat me into submission where i have to like fight my way out of it to just come out on top Mm -hmm. for example escape from tarkov that game is so unforgiving and there's nothing about it that is fun it's stressful and it's work playing it pretty much yeah like you really have to like put everything you have into learning it because you're otherwise you're going to fail and it's it's those type of games that i tend to be drawn to the ones that either have a large skill gap or have so much knowledge and so many little mechanics that you have to really learn and just kind of dive into it. Like I, I haven't met someone who plays call of duty, for example, that would play Tarkov the same way. It's just, it's just such a different feeling in game. It's, it's almost like I, I, it's almost like I enjoy the stress and enjoy the tension of the game. Yeah. Because you know, this, the tension, once you get through it has a, a proportional release. Like mm-hmm. if it the harder it is, once you complete it, the more proud you feel with yourself or just the the sense yeah. of accomplishment. I feel like there's mm-hmm. a there's a lot of well, I've noticed a good amount of crossover between things like uh, RuneScape, World of Warcraft, and people going to Tarkov mm-hmm. because the really hardcore people, like my roommate, is is huge in in um in uh what's it called? Not meta gaming, um, mm-hmm. theory crafting. Theory crafting, like mm-hmm. what the right thing to do, what the right composition is, and the way that mm-hmm. I hear him talk about the raid composition for for WoW is the same way that I hear people talk about Tarkov, um, just on a more individual. Mm-hmm. Right, Tarkov is more individual based. Yeah, it, it, I'd say that. It, there's also a bunch of illusion in Tarkov. Illusion or illusion? Illusion. 
like the like the illusion of choice oh yeah 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 it's it, it's it's also it's it's kind of like the illusion of choice cut with which i highly recommend the, the video from veritas on that fantastic but also complicated i'll put that in the, and then, in um, the description down below yeah it's 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 actually a, like a really good description of how the illusion of choice is in tarkov and then you have the um <clears throat> The like just the the bad development side of it, and then the accidental feature side of it, where like they it wasn't intended to be this way, but now it is because it was received so well. It's like there's yeah. there's a bunch of like that stuff in there. The bugs but, become features. Yeah, pretty much. Like there, what well, I'm trying to remember. There was one bug that was good, surprisingly, but there's so many it just also was bad. <laughs> but it, it, they made it a feature. I can't remember what it was. It was, this is I'm, ta- I'm trying to think back like years like two three years ago right but i don't know yeah it's it's a it's it's a good good concept but bad execution in my mind yeah I'm waiting for someone else to do it well i mean you're wink, not wink. you're not even waiting you're just you're <laughs> like fuck it no one else is gonna do it so i'm just gonna do it yeah do you have much. do you have um, like a projected release date for alpha beta actual um, we were aiming for, was this is March now, so six months to our Kickstarter, which will be where we're showcasing all the art and everything. And then we're planning to have internal partnered testing under NDA mm-hmm. after that. And then we're going to have a closed uh, alpha and then a closed beta. And then we're going to release. Okay. Which the closed alpha and closed, well, so we're going to have a closed internal alpha where it's going to be all under NDA still because we're still like pure refinement mm-hmm. on mindset. <clears throat> and then for the closed beta, it's going to be on Steam Early Access through like a paywall, so to speak, because you, you have to pay to get a game. Mm-hmm. So you pay $45 to get into the beta and get a copy of the game. And then basically the beta ends when we release ver- version 1.0, which that roadmap is still being solidified of what all we're going to have in there. <clears throat> okay. So you're you're saying Kickstarter in about six months, give or take. So mm-hmm. it, it's April, right? Are we in April? No, we're still in March. March. Yeah. So it, mm-hmm. it's March fourteenth right now, twenty twenty one. So roughly September for the Kickstarter. Then you're thinking closed ba- closed alpha, six months, a year after that. Yeah, I mean, in in terms of more, uh, like understandable like timelines, because like, we use we use those terms just for development tracking, right? Mm-hmm. So we. We're in internal alpha right now in development. <clears throat> and then six months, we're going to have the Kickstarter showcasing what we've done. And then basically immediately after that, when the gameplay loop is ready, as soon as possible, we're going to have internal testing for all of our partnered people and our, our people in NDA. We're just going to test, 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 test as much as they can, get as much data, do as much scientific Q and A as they can. Mm-hmm. And then <clears throat> after that, we're basically going to release on Steam. And that's going to be, that's going to be it. It's gonna be Steam going forward, all the versions. Right, beta Steam or early access Steam, and then the the mm-hmm. full 1.0 version. Now, so like yeah. 2023, you think, or 2022, late 2022. Uh, ideally, we want to be released in Steam early access within 12 months. Oh wow, okay, so that's like yeah. <clears throat> how much? How much of mm-hmm. your week are you putting into this? Like, how many hours? I, it sounds like it's at least a 40 hour um, a week job. So. I currently have a 40 hour work schedule. Um, I'm actually opening my studio calendar right now. Um, let's see. So la- just last week, <clears throat> I usually get home at like six o'clock and I've put in last week about 12 hours last week, just uh, between the hours of seven and 11 PM mm-hmm. just every day. See, I, I basically get home, eat, and then, while I'm eating, I'm just brainstorming, like, what do I have to do? How am I going to improve it? And then I jump on and I do it. Wow. Do you, do you have any, um, like, habits or just methods to keep yourself on track? Because that that's a lot of work, to have to go work a full day, come back, and then... I know it's a passion project, but still, sometimes mm-hmm. you need that extra kick. So do you have any any strategies to keep yourself mentally there? Um, In terms of keeping myself mentally motivated... The only thing I have to do is look at the team and just like I, op- I literally just open the studio discord. I click on the you click on it and look at the team members. And I'm like, that's who I have a responsibility to right now. This is what I have to do. And I, I just do it. 
you're such a proud dad. <laughs> like that's exactly what I hear yeah. when I when, like when I've talked to anyone who's a parent. They're like, you know what? I just mm-hmm. look at my kids and I'm like doing it for them. And it sounds like the same thing, which is yeah. really what you want. Like if you're in charge, you want to have that. I don't know if love is too strong of a word, but you have that, mm-hmm. you know, platonic love for them, for the project, for everything you guys are making. Yeah, because I mean, the the way I see it is when they applied to the team, they trusted me to that I'm putting in the work that I should be. And I, in turn, by taking them on the team and trusting them, they're going to put in the work that they should be. So <clears throat> if I'm if I'm not putting in the amount of work that I think I should be, probably even though it's way higher than I should be putting in, I still feel like I'm I'm failing to them, so I'm not doing what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. And therefore, why should they be working on the project if I'm not going to put in 110%? Yeah. That's kind of the mentality I have on that. I mean, that's what you want from a leader. Yeah. And then tying it to that exact actually statement, um, I, I've i always made sure to, em- to emphasize the difference between a leader and a boss. Mm-hmm. And like that, like... For example, like we we're start we're gonna be implementing a lead sound engineer soon. <clears throat> and that's like one thing it's like hard line with me. Like you you are not like the boss of this department, you lead this department. You just have higher responsibility than a normal member. Mm-hmm. So I mean like that's that's one thing I've I try to do personally and that I want to make sure the team does do if they're in leadership positions. Yeah. And just you, you set the culture by being, mm-hmm. you know, at the top and it just kinda <clears throat> I hate saying trickle down because it has such mm-hmm. a bad connotation now, but like that is one of those things that does yeah. filter down. It filters down from from the top. And then actually what I can do here real quick, it's probably you have double cams for a second too. <clears throat> but like this is, for example, like the studio hierarchy. Like you said, everything trickles down. Mm-hmm. Where do this. <clears throat> where it's, you know. If I if I don't set a precedent for the rest of the team, no, I can't expect anyone to follow it. And it just feels like an art director didn't set it. I can't expect the artist to follow it mm-hmm. type of thing. Yeah. So what what uh what's your ideal size for this company? I mean, ideally, I'd like to have multiple locations in multiple countries. <laughs> but, oh, so you, you want it to I mean, scale um, as big as it can get? Within reason, yes. Um, I don't want to, like, uh, like being realistic. When um, <clears throat> when we release on Steam, and we have a, enough funds, like an ample amount of funds, a studio bank account, right? <clears throat> we that's when we're gonna look at physical locations, because that's when we're gonna have the the most innovation. I feel like the most worth ethic put in, because then you're physically there, you're in that environment of development, mm-hmm. and that's kind of that's for me like if. I kind of tie it to the way I, when I was in the emergency room, <clears throat> working in the emergency room, <clears throat> is when when you're there and something traumatic has happened to someone, and everyone's mindset is we need to work on this together and get this done. It's it just it changes the way everyone feels in the room. Mm-hmm. It's a positive experience, even though you're working on something that's a negative experience. Like that's the whole. Like I want to create that environment that like we're all here because we want to be here and we love to do it and we have work to do so let's do it now as a team. Yeah. And like it, it it just that like propagates to everyone if if enough people have it. So that'll be the physical location would also be in about twelve months in an ideal timeline. Mm-hmm. Probably not. No. That's because <clears throat> physical location. Then we have to look at who's coming to the physical location. And then it's like flying people out contracts and a bunch of other finances we have to work out. So probably we're probably not gonna, we're probably not going to have a physical location uh, for a couple of years. Okay. So release twenty twenty two and then the frickin' studio make it to the moon by twenty twenty five. I mean that's the goal. I mean if if we make enough money to to get a physical location, I I can guarantee we're not going to have one uh, at the gate. Mm-hmm. Like even if we have the funds, those funds could be relocated to other quality improvements. Because I don't, there's no benefit to physical location right now. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, I don't know much about the or like the demographics that you have, but just knowing mm-hmm. that you've put in and the way that you're trying to structure your team, I like, I have I have full faith that you'll get to where you want to go. And even if where you want to go changes over time, like 
you know, mm -hmm. I'd invest. That's actually a funny conversation with investors too. Oh yeah, I, I'm I'm completely Go against on. investors. Are you really? Because mm -hmm. you just don't want to be yeah. beholden to their money. Exactly. I, like I don't want. It's almost like a sense of pride, which is probably a bad thing, but I don't want someone else to be like, "Hey, I, I, I helped make that." When in fact, all you did is hand me money. Because mm -hmm. then it'll be like, "You did, actually, you didn't do anything. They did everything." Yeah. Under our leadership, like I, I just, I, I don't know. I just didn't like the idea of investors having revenue. Like, for example, there's um, <clears throat> our producer brought this up to us me a while ago. It's um. It's kind of, it's almost like Unreal Engine Mega Grants, but they they give you some of money and they they want double their investment. Mm -hmm. And I I just don't want to just don't want to do that. I don't know. It's, I just I just don't want to have people investing like that and then having a responsibility to give them more than they invested type of thing. Therefore, giving them almost like a, a stake in the company, so to speak. It changes your perspective too, because then you're worried about will the game make money as opposed to will the game be good. Because mm -hmm. with, with yep. like Kickstarter, the investors are the people who are just who want the game. So you're the the mm -hmm. uh, the incentives are aligned correctly. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, like the um <clears throat> and like speaking on money, the, I'm I'm really not concerned of how financially profitable the country the country the company's <laughs> gonna be unless it doesn't allow me to pay the developers mm -hmm. because I mean, for example, like I obviously like managers and myself, we have to be able to have, we have to be able to, we have to make enough to be able to put the time in to do it. We have to be able to live, we have to be able to support our family, to be able to eat and sleep, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same has to be for our developers. So, I mean, if, if the company is financially struggling to make new improvements, so we can pay the team. We're fine. We just need to make the improvements without having to fund them. And then, cause I mean, I don't know. It's it's kind of a weird conversation because it's it's weird to talk about doing something that you have to put money into, but you're not going to and still expect the same improvement. It's kind of, I don't know. Yeah, it, but, it's weird. The whole incentive structure for companies is, especially mm -hmm. startups, because there is so much passion behind it. And I'm sure yeah. you're very cognizant to not take advantage of the passion, you know? Yeah, it's because I, I, like, I really want this to go you know, to the moon, for example, mm -hmm. but it's, you, you have to really anchor yourself in terms of what you're doing and in what realistically you have to do to get there instead of like being so like excited about it and then just making completely irrational decisions and then ruining the project as it goes type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's a lot, man. It really is. Well, mm -hmm. I know we're coming close to your, your, uh, your time limit. So do you have anything else you want to say? Anything else you want to plug? Any, uh, any, I don't know, words you want to throw at my face? I mean, I could throw a couple words, but you're too far. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, in terms of like plug, I don't really have anything to plug really. I'm, I'm kind of a ghost in a sense. <laughs> I stream on Twitch rarely, but <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm effectively a ghost. Well, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you after this and see if you want me to put anything down in the description. Um, Frickit Studios, do you have a, you don't have a site yet, right? No, that's, that's, that's where you that's come where in. That's where I come Mr. in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we got Frickit Studios. We got Dr. Soup 143? 143. 143 mm -hmm. uh, on Twitch. And anything else I think of, I'll throw down in the description below. Um, and otherwise... Thanks a lot, Sean. This was this was a really good conversation. I had fun. Yeah, it was this. It's it's nice to be able to talk about this to someone who actually understands to an extent of what we're what we're discussing. Because some people are just like, huh? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah developers. Yeah. <laughs>